Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I am very excited to welcome back Mr. John Barclay. Hey John. Hello Nicole, it's good to be back. Thank you for having me. Yes, we're excited to have you back. We have um, him here to present Crafting Your Images with Topaz. So I'm excited to see what tips he has for us today. John is an award-winning freelance photographer. He's based out of Bucks County, Pennsylvania and he's a passionate photographer and enthusiastic workshop leader. He's been leading workshops and tours around the world for some time now. Recently, John was invited to join National Geographic photographers Jonathan Kingston, Dewitt Jones, and Ricky Cook to co-lead the See the Light seminar in Molokai, Hawaii, so that's very exciting. In addition, John was personally selected by Dewitt to be part of the HealingImages.org project, and he was the recipient of an excellent award from B&W Magazine. We have also used his images in our own advertising and marketing, and he has uh, been presenting us, presenting for us since the beginning. So we are always happy to have him back. With that, I will go ahead and turn the screen over to John. Well, thank you, Nicole. I always appreciate the Topaz team, and you're right, it does go back to the beginning when we first met at a trade show, and uh, you guys were just getting started, so I have been around since the beginning, and I'm glad I've, I have been. So, okay, well, again, thank you, Nicole, and, and to the Topaz team for having me back. I, I think I say this every time, I'm always amazed that people come back, so I'm grateful for that, and I, I see we have almost the full house again today. Probably some repeat people, uh, but usually there's always news, so I'd like to take a minute and just talk about philosophy real quickly and uh, my style of presenting. Uh, I'm not necessarily about presenting great images today. Hopefully they're good images, I mean, but they're not necessarily a finished product and, and done. Really uh, what I'd rather do is teach some concepts and some ideas, some techniques, some tips and tricks, if you will, so that then you can incorporate those into what I refer to as crafting your images. And I use crafting on purpose because it's not, not just processing images. Hopefully you're doing a little bit more than that. You know, when we're capturing images, we should be mindful of the composition and the correct exposure and, and those types of things and getting as much right in camera. Well, the second part of the process is, is crafting that image with the tools that we have with folks like Topaz. So that's my hope is that as we go through a few of these images that you'll walk away some, with some ideas that will inspire you to use these tools that Topaz has uh, given to us to craft your specific images. So with that, Let's go ahead and, and get started. And there's probably some of you repeats out there who are saying, hey, look at that. He's finally using Lightroom. Well, that's true. This is the first time using Lightroom since uh, I presented before. And I made an effort, as I promised I would. What I'm going to do, um, of course, you know, and, and maybe some who don't know, from within Lightroom, if we right-click on the image we want to work on, in order to get to the plugins for Topaz, you're going to need to use Fusion Express. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Just recognize that's one way to get there. I'm going to go ahead and use Photoshop most of the time so I can create a layer and we can show you befores and afters and so forth. So I'm going to go ahead and open that in Photoshop. It's going to take a, a couple of seconds here uh, while that comes up. It always takes longer than I want. And let's make that a little bit smaller so we can see it together properly. So let's start with this image. And what I'd like to do is go back to the basics of this time in, in this particular webinar. And what I mean by that is let's go back to what uh, the product that Topaz built their reputation on, and that is Adjust, Topaz Adjust, which is up, I believe, to version 5 now. And what makes this so powerful, so here we have an image from my recent trip to the Palouse. I mean, the, the light was coming right into my face. It's just up above in the sky there to the left, and it's really bright and difficult to get a really good single exposure. Yes, I could do some work in Lightroom, brighten it up, but we didn't quite get there. So let's open up, adjust, and see what we can do here. Um, just a little side thought here. With Adjust, uh, some, it is sticky settings, which means it'll remember what you did last time. So you'll see me off times go to the bottom right and just hit Reset All so that it goes back to the default settings. 
as with any of the plugins from Topaz, the left side is going to show you the presets that they've worked on, and um, and you can certainly click on those, and they'll give you something to start with. As I like to say, they're good jumping-off points. Uh, those who have been with me before recognize I'm much more interested in the right side and what I can do over here uh, because I want to have complete control over the crafting of my image. I don't necessarily want a program or you know a preset to, to do the work for me. I'd rather understand what's going on the right side. And the key, because I want to cover a number of different plugins today, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but the, the key area that you need to be mindful of is this adaptive exposure from within uh, Topaz Adjust. An adaptive exposure I like to explain is it's like an auto adjust on steroids if you will. Some programs you click one button it's done and you don't have any more control over that. Well here we have an adaptive exposure that the more I pull it to the right the more it adjusts the exposure in this image and you can see it's doing a pretty darn good job especially in that foreground of bringing out the light. But the sky is getting a little bit overcooked. What makes adjust really powerful though is not just that, that we can adjust it from 1 to 100 if you will, but that we can use the region sliders. And the way that works is on the, if I have that region slider way to the left, it's affecting the outside, um, the lights and the brights, or the light lights and the bright brights. The more I bring this to the right, the tone, there's more tonalities that are going to be affected by this top slider. So if I pull it all the way to the right, all of the tonalities in the image are going to be adjusted. And now that sky doesn't look near as overcooked. We'll bring this back. It's always somebody is always going to say, well, what would you recommend for good settings? Well, I, I tend to be a third of the way in on adaptive exposure and regions about half the way. But as you can see in this image, we can even go further over uh, because I think halfway that it gets way too dark in this area of the sky. Uh, and in this one, we're going well beyond the third mark and upwards of about a half or maybe even a little more to bring out the brightness in the foreground. So this, to me, this image is a perfect example to remind you and the, or introduce those who are new to the real power of Topaz Adjust. So let's click before. Pretty dark in the foreground, no detail in the grass, the sky is a little washed out, there's no texture and detail in the sky that I remember seeing. A couple of slider moves and we've brought out the light, uh, lightened up the, the barn, lightened up the grasses and so forth. And beyond that, we, we have more control beyond those two. We can use the lightness, we can use the contrast, and by the way, oft times when you're adding a lot and we are of the adaptive exposure, bringing, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, you're going to bring your contrast down to the left a little bit, and it actually brings back a more natural feel um, when we use that adaptive exposure. Just a, a little thought here too, you, you, this feels a little bit blue to me. So you do have a warmth slider here, we can certainly come into the finishing touches and add some warmth and take away some of that blue from the sky. Or I'm just going to introduce you to a non-Topaz little trick that I do. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and accept OK here. That's the only thing about working with Lightroom is things go a little bit slower. Um, then I used to make smaller JPEGs and so things would move right along. OK, so here we are back in, in Photoshop. And for those of you who have Photoshop and or Elements, Here's something that I do all the time when I'm feeling like there's a color cast. I will go to my adjustment uh, choices and I'll pick on a curves adjustment. I will go to the middle dropper, which is the gray dropper, and it's basically like you have a white balance tool. And now I can click somewhere in the gray sky here until I find something that feels right and that feels about right. And now we've gone from kind of a blue to a much more warmed up scene, a much more natural looking scene. So once again, you open up a curves dialog box, the gray dropper or the middle dropper here, and it's acting essentially like a white balance tool, and then your job is to find something of a neutral tonality and click on that 
and then remember, you know, if that's if you you feel like it's overdoing it a little bit, you can go to your opacity slider here, which is where your conversation is happening between this curves layer that I just put in here in the background, and I can bring this back and introduce some of that blue back in there. So I'll bring it down to 80% or so, and now we have something that looks pretty natural. So there's Topaz just quickly to remind you, and the point of this one was again to remind you of the power of that software for difficult images uh, such as that one. Okay, let's move on to the next one. I'm again right click, edit in, and I'll go into Photoshop once again. And this time what I want to be introducing you to is uh, the next plugin, and that's Detail. Detail 3, I believe, we're up to. Okay. Another Palouse image. I always like to use recent ones so that we're talking about different images and seeing different things happen uh, rather than repeat images. I love this scene. It's the one we go back to over and over again, and the sky was just wonderful and dramatic. But to me, there's not enough detail in this uh, dramatic sky. And so it just made sense to me. I'll make a background layer just to, to have it here. Let me go back up here and let's go to detail three and what I love about this image and, and by the way this takes a little longer to open and the reason it does is it's essentially building three layers in the background three layers because in in the plug-in detail here uh, you're able to work on small medium and large details from within the image and that's what makes this so powerful and there's some other things that we'll talk about in another image uh, some other sliders here uh, that add uh, something that you probably don't know about and I think you're going to really like as we move along to another image. Okay, same thing. On the left side, we have uh, different sets of collections, which then have different presets that you're welcome to, to experiment with. But yeah, as you can guess, I'd rather go over to the right side. So notice over here, just real quickly, I'm on the right side of the screen. You can either work on the shadows and or the highlights or, or the overall tonality of the scene. And, in fact, you can work on the small, medium, and large details. And then you have a boost control for each of those three. Really, we're going to spend just a little bit of time here and, and just, I think, visually, you're going to be able to see what's going on here. So what are small details? The best way is go ahead and pull the slider over and take a look. Look at the sky now and how affected it is by pulling that way over. Well, here, let's just do before. There's before and there's after. Boy, it's brought a lot of detail. Maybe a little too much. I wonder what the medium would do. Well, let's look at that. And I think what's nice here is you're going to visually see the difference. I'm going to pull it over about the same. Wow, too much, right? And so the medium, pulling it over to the same amount roughly to the 70, right, 0 0.70, you can see that it's affecting it, and especially down in the foreground here, my goodness, it's you know, really crunchy at that point. And I'm overdoing it so that you can see it. Let's see what the large details does. Ah, that's interesting. So it's, it's, it's soft, it's almost, you know, it's such a large detail that it's almost softening that sky a little bit. So I thought it would be very instructive to this image because it'll where this shines, where this plug and shines, is where we want to affect a certain size of, of a detail. And in this case, rather than hitting it over the head with a sledgehammer, with other choices we might make, whether it be from within Photoshop or other plugins, what they've given us here, what Topaz has given us, is the ability to just bring back some of that texture in the sky, that brooding sky, if you will, without overdoing it. So maybe it's not real apparent to you by hitting here's before again and here's after, but for me it's significant and it's doing exactly what I want to do. I don't want it to be in your face. Let me go back to a common phrase I'm always suggesting when I'm leading my workshops or tours and we're talking about processing. If you look at one of my pictures and you say, wow, John did a great job with Detail 3 from Topaz, I've failed. You shouldn't be able to tell what I've done. So it should be subtle. Right? So some of these things that I'm introducing you to, they might not be in your face and you might be saying, wow, that's not a real lot going on there. But to me, it's a, it's a lot going on and it's doing it in a very subtle, tasteful way. 
And I might just bump up the mediums just a touch. And I can't encourage you strongly enough to be careful. Uh, it's really easy to overdo it, and you can get to an HDR look even. Um, so you should maybe look away from your screen and then look back, because I think you'll find that you oft times have overdone it. And I don't want to leave here until I go down to the mask and, and just introduce you and, or, or maybe remind you. If you don't want that effect to be happening down here, you can leave your strength in the mask. I've rolled open the effect mask here. And I can leave the strength way to the left. I can make my brush size bigger or smaller. I can have the hardness. And you'll notice I want to bring that hardness down a little bit. So the softness in the brush is the distance between the inner circle and the outer circle. And I want that so that when I use the edge aware way up high, meaning I want it to do a good job of finding my edges. So the further I move that edge aware to the right, the more it's going to find that edge. And now, as long as I, the last thing I click on is the brush size, now I can use my bracket keys to make my brush smaller or bigger. And the bracket keys are next to the letter P. And now what I can do is I can paint with this and by the way, the edgeware technology that Topaz has is spectacular. And so by painting through here, you'll notice in the mask up here, I'm pointing to the mask here, all the white reveals in a mask, black conceals in a mask. So I am concealing in here the, the foreground, which I don't want any of the effect to be placed upon. And now, just the sky is receiving this treatment of before and after and adding wonderful texture and detail back into that sky. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more and go back into detail a little bit deeper here in a second. So I'm just going to cancel out of this for now. We're going to move on to the next one because time always goes so stinking fast. OK, let's, let's stay in the Palouse. And now let's go here. Well, that opened up real fast. That was nice. OK, so what do I want to do here? In all honesty, this image coming out of Lightroom doesn't look too bad. But here's what I've learned. I've learned that when you use, and this is probably one of my favorite, and that's Clarity in one of the newer uh, plugins from Topaz is Clarity. Well, Clarity is spectacular, and I realize when I use it that my image really was not finished. It needed uh, more pop, I like to call it, and that, that can be done usually with multiple contrast. Well, those Lightroom experts out there might be saying, well, John, just use the Clarity slider. And you'd be right. The Clarity slider does a really good job, and the Clarity slider, especially in Lightroom 5 with the new processing engine, it's fantastic. I love it, and I do use it. Uh, but in all honesty, I like this better. And so what I tend to do is go ahead. Let's go back. Actually, let me just make a layer just in case I want to toggle that. Let's go into Clarity. And let me show you why uh, I tend to like this. Again, I'm going to hit Reset just to make sure. OK. Once again, all of your presets over here. And actually, I'm going to go away from my normal council. Um, it's not a bad idea, because Clarity might be a little confusing to you with the names on the right side and what they really do. And so I even went to the left side, clicked on Landscape up here. Uh, and then I was looking at these particular presets. Uh, and I was able to get a good idea of what was happening to the sliders on the right side to give me a good flavor or feel for what make, might, might make more sense. And here's what I've learned from my experience with this program. And so let's slow down and kind of back up, because this, this is great stuff. Clarity in Lightroom or in Photoshop is, again, it's a sledgehammer in my mind. It's one slider that affects essentially local contrast. What we have here is four sliders. And so we have four, again, almost sizes, if you will, a lot like detail does. So how do we figure out what's going on? Same way. Let's pull it aggressively to the right and see what happens. Way overdone. I get that. But I just want you to see the difference here. I'm going to bring that back. Let's see what happens when we use low contrast. Way overdone still, but it looks slightly different. 
convective medium contrast. Yeah, not quite as overcooked. It certainly makes it dark, uh, but it's a little more pleasant. High contrast, what's going to happen there? <clears throat> hmm, it looks like it's affecting really the outside edges again, the lights and the dark. So what's a common way to use this? Well, I'm finding that I put in a little bit, and I'm talking about 0.19 here is all I'm going to do. Low contrast, I might bring over just a little bit less than that. And then you're going to be start pulling things to the left, medium contrast to the left, a little bit high contrast to the left a little bit. Let's hopefully, it's subtle, folks, but hopefully you're going to be able to see it. I'm going to click before, after. So I'm going to do it a couple times so you can look at the sky and you can look at the barn, the red, and look at the canola. So here's before. Let's look at the sky together. After. You can see that I've added some nice contrast, local contrast into the clouds, and those clouds really pop. Let's look at the barn now, the barn and the canola. All of a sudden, that yellow takes on a more vibrant cast for me. The barn gets a nice lot of detail. And the overall scene before again, <clears throat> excuse me, after we've added pop, if you will, local contrast, and, and made this pop. But let's see, here's where it gets really interesting. I would recommend you always have your histogram open and, and are watching what happens. And it looks like over here on the left side, we just barely are clipping on the left, and that's our darks. And here's the real magic and the real power is in this tone level. Anytime we're doing work with these four sliders and we're introducing contrast, we are going to be pushing the edges of the histogram to the point where they may, in fact, crash or clip is a, probably a better word. And if they do clip, what Topaz has given us is the ability to recover that right here. So if my left side is clipping just ever so little, I'm going to go to the black slider, and I'm going to push it to the right just a little bit until that's no longer clipping, and now it's not. Now it's not touching. Now let's take a look at before, after. Gosh, I hope it's showing up in, in, in a webinar because I know sometimes it doesn't translate um, you know, doing this because the screen refreshers are slow and so forth. But just trust me, now, that, now the, the effect that we were able to get from these four sliders, as subtle as it was, it was still making it kind of blocked up and a little bit too dark. But now by just, uh, I mean, I'm up at 0 0.09 here, just very, very little bit uh, of recovery, if you will, with the tone level, and we're good to go. You're going to see this again um, in another image where we'll kind of cement what's going on there, and it'll actually have a bigger impact on these blacks and whites, and you'll see how we can rein those in here in a minute. I want to just introduce you uh, as well to the second part of what makes a clarity so uh, if effective. Uh, this barn looks a little washed out to me, and there's many ways I realize that I can affect that color. There's a selection brush, um, a brush adjustment brush rather in Lightroom that I could use, and I've certainly done that. But my gosh, it's it's really easy here. If I click here to the this is a, the HSL layer here, so that's hue saturation. And luminosity. So I take it off a of hue and go to saturation, and of course the barn is red. Let's see what happens if I push this red over. Look at that. It's just affected the red in the barn. Well, that canola, boy, I sure remember being there, and it was like in your face yellow. So let's see what would happen if I punch that yellow up a little bit. It's just affecting the yellow. That's pretty dramatic. So again, let's click on this for a before. Before after. Not only have we given us the local, has it given us the local contrast with these sliders up here, we were able to recover some of the blocking up that was starting to happen because of the local contrast we're doing, and right from this plug-in I can affect the uh, the red barn and the yellow, and of course if I wanted to, I'm going to click on luminosity this time, so let's go to the luminosity and let's make that sky just a little bit darker. That's a lot darker. It's too much. So just a very little bit, and now we've really punched up the blue in that sky, which every time I'm out in the blues, I'm blown away. It's, it really is that blue, blue, and it really is that beautiful. So I don't know about you. I'm hoping it's showing. There's before on the whole thing, 
and there's after. So an image that I thought was finished here, coming right out of Lightroom, boy, by the time I'm done with it, I'm sure I'm glad I remembered that I better use Clarity. It's worth the price of admission. So we'll let it do its work there. Always hate dead air time, right? It's terrible. I feel like I should be telling a joke or something. So here we are back into Photoshop. And oftentimes, just a side note, why do I sometimes, or why do I most all the times, make a duplicate layer? Because, uh, and this is kind of just my workflow habit, and again, it goes back to that idea of it's really easy to overdo things. Uh, I, I'm, my constant instruction to myself and to those I teach is to back off by about 20% uh, on everything you do. So oftentimes I'll come in, come down to about 80%. And the reason I do that is you're still going to have a powerful impact of what you just did. But I just have learned over time that I tend to overdo things, and I find most everybody else does, and you need to tame things down or tone down what you've done, and this gives me an easy way to quickly and easily do that and uh, restore some sanity to my uh, processing and my overzealousness sometimes. Okay, keep moving along here because I look at the clock and it's moving right along. Let's see if we can't go, now that we've introduced you to the ideas, uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster in a way of cementing some of the things that we just spoke about on this one. And of course, this one doesn't want to open up as fast. What well, gives me a chance to get a drink? Okay, there we go. This was my blog post today, one of my favorite locations in the Palouse. And boy, everything was working together. Yellow canola, red barn in the canola, light on the tree, leading line, white puppy clouds. Again, I think I'm done. Well, let, let's just see how done I was. So we're going to go back into here. Oh, actually, let's do this first. I'm going to go back here. Go back into Clarity. Again, we'll move a little faster here. Remember, these are sticky settings, so it's remembering what I did on the last picture. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go get my histograms so I can see what's going on. This is my normal workflow. We're going to go ahead and add in some micro contrast, and you can see that's already shifting. Look at that, it's blowing out my histogram on the right. I'm going to bring this down a little bit here. Almost the same shape I made on the last one, which makes sense because that's about what we're working on. But like I said, you'll, you'll notice that we're going to have to use these tone levels. And on this image, and every image is different, notice how much effect this had. Uh, I don't think it's going to change. No, when I click on and off, it's not going to change. So I like what it's doing of adding that local contrast, but it's making my tree line a little bit dark, and it's blowing out my clouds. So once again, what do we do? This black is clipping. Let's address that first. I'm going to push this to the right just a little bit until that goes away. All it's taken is about 0.13, and now that darkness is fixed. Let's go to the right side here and come to the white level, and let's pull to the left. It's just intuitive, right? If it's, if it's crashing on the right, you're going to pull the left, to the, uh, pull the white to the left. If it's crashing here, you're going to push it to the right. And now let's take a look at the before, after. Again, even more subtle than the last one, but it's significant to me. It's taken it from uh, what was apparent has an apparent flatness to it. It now has actually a lot of nice local contrast, and it's making it jump off of my screen. And because I have these three sliders in tone, and that's, to me, the magic of the software, is allows me to rein back in those problems that are being created by adding local contrast. You don't have that capability with just the clarity slider in Lightroom. I, I guess you effectively you do. You can change your highlight slider and your white and black slider if you needed to. Let's come down here again. And that barn, even though it's a little smaller, we can certainly add some contrast and make that red pop. could do the same thing again to make sure that yellow canola in the field is really screaming at us, and on and on and on. And in this case, I think I will go to the blue in the sky and make that blue a little darker uh, by pulling down on the luminosity, and I think you get the idea. I'm going to go ahead and accept that and let that go out because I want to do one more thing and now move on and introduce you uh, to the next thought.
and let me scroll down on my notes over here that you can't see, so I stay on task. Okay, so here's before, here's after. We can certainly see the difference in them. I'm clicking before again. I'll do it three or four times here as I'm talking, but you can certainly see the skies changing, the depth of the clouds because of using clarity has changed, uh, and in the tree, I mean the tree just jumps off the screen for me. That light on the tree is exactly like I remember it now, popping right off the screen. Okay, well, what else can we do? Well, why don't we now go ahead and open up black and white effects and just introduce you to another choice, and, and I'll be redundant on this as well in another image. All right, and it's remembering what I did the last time. Okay, so this is probably another piece of software that it makes sense to look at the presets, and uh, you know, because the classic, quite honestly, is pretty darn good right out of the box. So just want to introduce you, in the, again, the essence of time here and make sure we get through a couple more images. Yeah. It's common for me to go first to the, to the right side, as I tend to like to do, and click on the different filters and see what they'll give me. And they'll give me slightly different things. A green filter is going to affect things differently. The sky is a little more washed out. Uh, blue usually doesn't work on these types of scenes. But this yellow, not too bad, making that tree really scream. I think I like the orange. The main thing I want to just point out in the black and white effects is not only is it easy, and by the way, the presets in black and white effects are actually a blast. They're actually a lot of fun, and I will act, uh, fi oft times find some things uh, that I wouldn't have thought of and get good creative ideas. So again, this is a, a program I, where I would encourage you to play on the left side. But what I want to really point out here is this tool called the color filter. So these filters up here are presets, essentially, right? They're, they're creating a preset, and this is what the preset looks like, these two sliders here. But you're not limited to just these six choices as far as filters. You can now make the strength go up, and look what happens with that dark sky. That dark sky is getting even darker by leaving it on that yellow or orange preset. And then if I want to, I can slide this. And so essentially, you have the whole color spectrum to be able to fine tune the look of the black and white choices that you're making. So truly you can be crafting and rather than just one click to say, hey, let's put an orange filter. No, you can put an orange filter and change the effect by varying the strength of that orange filter or you can tweak it to be somewhat of an orangey yellow filter. And then beyond that, you can just click right above it to the color sensitivity and this is different than the color filter. This now works on the, each of the individual colors. So you would think if I go to the blue, it's going to make that black sky, or yeah, well, it's blue sky. We would make the blue sky get darker, and sure enough, it does. And if I wanted to go to the yellow slider, I could tone, tone down uh, the, the yellow canola, or I could really pump it up and make it in your face white too much, right? So that's the main thing I want to show you on this particular image is how powerful it is and how simple it is to get really good high quality black and white. Uh, and we haven't talked about the finishing touches and then I'll, hopefully we'll have time here. I'll talk about that a little bit coming up. Um, and let's leave it at that. I'm, I'm going to get way ahead of myself here. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this uh, rather than keep it so that we can move on a little more quickly and not waste time with that saving. Okay. I know somebody out there is saying, take a breath, John. I tend to want to include a lot here. Let me look at my time. Okay, let's try to get through two more here if we can. <clears throat> okay, this is important. I definitely wanted to get to this one because I've talked about denoise, but I haven't spent enough time ever really showing it, and this finally does what I need it to do. That image seems awfully small to me. It loaded so fast. Let me just check something here. No, nope, that's fine. Okay, I just want to make sure it wasn't a small image. Okay, so let's go back up to filter, and let's go into denoise. Arguably one of the best, if not the best, noise reduction software on the market. And let me kind of show you what's going on here. Let me make sure to hit reset. Hopefully you can see in the top left, and by the way, if you're having trouble seeing from within in the denoise interface, over here on the right side, you have an auto brighten. Mine's set off right now. If I go normal, 
that makes it a little easier to see the noise that's going on. This was shot at ISO 1600 handheld. Um, and if I go to strong, we can see it even better. It blows out the right side of the image. That's fine. I really don't care because I want to be looking at what's going on here. So I'll go back to normal for the moment. And I'm going to go right over to raw light because I've imported uh, from Lightroom a raw image. Now maybe we'll turn this on and off. So here's before and all of that noise is pretty apparent and here's after. But it's maybe a little more than I need and that's the value of using these auto brightens because you can't quite see it as much here and certainly if you turn it off, if I go before, after, I can see it, you might not be able to with the slow refresh rates you know, during a webinar here, but hopefully by going to strong you're able to see the noise and now not. So I might back it off to the lightest setting and now there's before and there's after. Certainly it's the first thing you want to do because if you're going to add local contrast as I'm going to here in a second, uh, you want to make sure you're not amplifying that noise. So do that noise work first. So if that's all I want to do. Unfortunately this takes a little bit of time to process. And by the way, this is the, a Geary building. I'm an addict. I love Geary's architecture, and uh, I'm going to use it as an excuse to go to Spain and see the Guggenheim and photograph that. But uh, I've photographed this building, which is the Experience Music Project building in Seattle, <coughs> as well as the LA Concert Hall, the Disney Concert Hall in LA. And there's one in um, Vegas that I photographed. They're a lot of fun. All right, so let's go here next. And this is kind of cool. I want you to see what's going to happen here. We're going to go to detail again. I told you we'd come back here, and I'm going to show you something that I think is awfully cool, and I suspect a lot of people don't know about. And I think you're going to have a new tool uh, to add to what you want to do. So let's make sure to reset. Okay, so remember we spoke about we can adjust, we can, within Topaz Detail 3, we can adjust the medium, small, and large, or small, medium, and large. So let's do that a little bit. I'll go ahead and affect some of these details and then this one I'm just going to do a little bit more of the small details, a little bit less of the uh, medium details. So before, after, you're going to have a hard time seeing that but that's not really what I want to point out. That was by way of refresher how to use these. What I want to point out to you is these. Under the tone panel if you come down here, you have cyan red, magenta green, yellow blue. And in my mind, I'm thinking, what the heck? Why do I need to shift the color? And then I started to play with these sliders, and I realized that's not at all what's happening. What's happening with these is it is darkening and lightening the tonalities. Let's see if we can't point out what's happening. So if I pull this to the right, look at that bottom left of the image. If I pull it to the left, it's darkening that tonality. So there, there's some red, certainly some strong red influence in that bottom left corner. And by simply pulling this way to the right, it's like glowing. That's exactly what it's doing. I think that's huge. Now let's do, let's see what's happening here. And now let's look at the top of the image. If we look up at the top, how, how is that affecting the colors up there? It's, uh, it's adding more color to the bottom of that swirling plate there. If I pull it to the right, it's darkening those colors up to the top. I kind of like what it's doing there. If I use the yellow and blue, it's even darkening those panels a little more up there, which is a little more than I want. So I think I'll pull that over here, and that's a nice balance. So let's go before, after. Again, we're not looking for in-your-face things. We're looking for subtle crafting of your images here. And I don't know about you, but I think that is a whole lot better than when it started out. I'll even pull that all the way over here because I love this glow. And I love what these sliders have done to really bring out the contrast and the colors uh, and deepen and make those rich colors in, in this wonderful swirling plate of metal that's coming in front of the, the background wall. So hopefully that's something new before, after, that you'll, you'll think about and coming back to use detail, not only to enhance the details in your images and do it on small, medium, and large instead of that sledgehammer effect, but you can also play with those uh, tonal sliders to affect uh, the, the darkness and lightness of those ranges of colors. I think that's pretty cool. Okay. 
Of course, I love all this stuff. Everything's cool to me. Okay, one, let's look at the time. Oh my gosh, we're out of time. Let's do this really fast. Uh, go here. I wish I knew why some of these open faster than others. And this is a scene in Cuba. I I'm, have the privilege of uh, leading some tours down to Cuba with my good friend Tony Sweet. And we're going again coming up this uh, January. As a matter of fact, we have two spots available, two rooms, if somebody wants to come to Cuba. Um, OK, why do I have this here? Let me make sure I have my notes. Um, let's go back into and finish up with just this cool idea and just cement uh, the power of black and white uh, effects and, and why I think it's worth your time to go investigate a couple of cool little things that can, can go on here. All right, so let's do it again. Let's reset, and in this case, in the essence of time, I'm going to go ahead and go to the Platinum Collection, and I'm going to come down because I know what I like here. I'm going to hit the, the straight Platinum and click on that, and you know, right away you should be able to see, wow, just that fast, and in all candor, you're almost done on this particular image, even with a one-click. That's why I say it's important to go look at those those presets. They're really valuable. But again, if you wanted to fine-tune, you can go over here and click on um, on the uh, filters if you want, and then you can fine-tune it here, right? As we talked about, just by way of review, and we can go to the color sensitivity, and we can use those if we want to. But let's leave it at that. What I want to also bring to your attention, and this is what's baked right into, is uh, right into the black and white, is adaptive exposure. It should be familiar from the very first picture I did. What we have is the same adaptive exposure that's found in Topaz Adjust. Right here's the adaptive exposure in the regions. So if this area behind the young boy gets a little blocked up, which it tends to, and you can't quite see the women in the back. I should be able to push this over just a little bit and bring back some of that detail. I don't want to bring a lot. I want there to be some mystery about that. But by going into that adaptive exposure and regions again, I'm able to impact this black and white uh, conversion right from within one piece of software. We're not done yet. Let me just go through one last thing here. Let's go to finishing touches. I've showed this before, but for those who are new, you're going to love this. Let's go to the transparency slider. Hmm, I wonder what the transparency slider does. Well, simple. What it's going to do is bring back some of the background color image. It's not going to bring it all back. It never does. But that's great, because here's what it's going to do. In my mind, in Cuba, what I like is to give that old world feel, or old film feel, and even a weathered, faded film feel. Well, look at this. How's that for a weather faded film look? Bingo, you're done. So I can bring in as much of that back. Look, I'll push it all the way to one. It's still not even close to what the color image was. But boy, you bring it back down to 70%, 60%, and now you have a wonderful old feeling film look almost from a black and white conversion. So it looks great as black and white, but it also feels really good as this soft, um, again, film look. Uh, color image, uh, and I think for specifically images coming out of Cuba, it works really well. Thank All you right. so this much, John. This part. has been awesome. You're welcome. I love coming, and thank you for having me again. Appreciate it. Absolutely, and we're excited to have you back a couple more times in the next few months. Looking forward to it. And thanks, right. everybody, for joining us, and I hope you have a good morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you are, and we'll be talking to you hopefully on Thursday. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay.